Our service of Holy Eucharist, right one, begins on page 323 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 323. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee. We give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Father Almighty. O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us, for thou only art holy. Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up thy power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let thy bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of faints of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The psalm appointed for debt today is Psalm 126. We'll do verses 1 through 7 by whole verse. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then we were like those who dream. And our king with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad to you. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negev. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy shouldering their sheaves. The second lesson is a reading from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body keep be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory be to you, Lord Christ. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ.
In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Have you ever been asked to prove your identity? We all get asked this from time to time. Uh, you might have to do that to get a driver's license or to fly on a plane. We have documents and photographs that go back to our very births to show who we are in the eyes of the law. But there are other ways to show who you are, other sources of identity. If you have your ID card with you today, I invite you to pull it out. It takes a while to get to it underneath these vestments. Give me a second. Uh, and let's look at them. If maybe it, pull it out of your wallet or your purse, or, or if you're at home, take a moment now to go and find it. That's fine. Um, and let's look at our, our IDs. Not everybody has them. That's okay. I'm looking at a Missouri driver's license. Maybe you've got a passport or a student ID or maybe one of the new real ID cards. I'm telling you, it took my wife seven visits to the DMV, seven visits to get her real ID card. That was rough. <laughs> and of course, in Illinois, we're all supposed to have one by next year, but we can't you know, fly on a plane. So if you have an ID, look at it closely. It probably has a picture of you in the past, maybe the recent past, maybe the long past. Maybe it's not your favorite picture in the world. <laughs> it may have a physical description of you, your eye color, your height, your weight minus 15 pounds. This is because we in America tend to believe that who you are is deeply connected to your body. Other cultures do things differently. In Pakistan, for instance, in order to get a government ID, you have to have your parent or a close blood relative with you to testify to your identity because it has more to do with family there. But our sense of who we are is changing. ID cards throughout the world now are encoded with biometric chips. Likely, I don't think ours are, but you do have probably a scanning code or something on the back of your ID. Um, probably has some sort of electronic uh, uh, code or something on there so that you can easily be connected to a computer record because we all know if it's not digital, it's not real, right? Who we are is very closely connected now to our digital information. But of course, these documents cannot really express the fullness of who we are. And you can put away your ID now if you want to. Yesterday morning, I was blessed uh, to be here in church and perform the funeral for Lorraine Leibel, right here. Um, and if you had asked the friends and family of Lorraine who were gathered here, who she was. They would not have showed you her passport or her social security card or her driver's license. In the end, those things are actually pretty poor representations of a person's real identity. No, those who knew Rainey talked of her smile and the years that she spent in our choir and the love, her love of cooking and crochet and the international trips that she took about which she loved to tell. They spoke of Dawn, her husband, and of her family, and of her home, and of her heroic final battle with disease, and of her hope in Christ. These are far better documents to show who a Christian really is. These can be presented at the gates of heaven, where no other entrance fee or official document will suffice to prove your identity, your real identity, in the eyes of God is a much more complicated question than a government-issued ID card or a computer record can answer. In our gospel reading for today, which we just heard, uh, John the Baptist is being asked to prove his identity. The religious leaders of his people sent an embassy to him to ascertain just who he thought he was and what he thought he was doing. <laughs> Their question reveals what they're really concerned about. They're not concerned about his height and his weight and his eye color. They're not concerned about his family or his people or where he's from. Look at the questions they ask. Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that was foretold that would come in the spirit and power of Elijah? Are you the prophet that is supposed to herald Messiah's coming? These are not biometric ID questions, right? They're eschatological ID questions. 
Questions that have to do with God's great plan and his redemption of Israel. And in a sense, these are exactly the right questions for them to ask because these religious leaders have the work of God in view. They care about what God is doing in the world. In fact, some of these descriptions do fit John the Baptist pretty well. Jesus will later tell his disciples that John is indeed to be identified with Elijah. John himself is constantly heralding the coming Messiah, the thong of whose sandals he's not worthy to untie. So John's negative answers to these real ID questions of the first century can be confusing. We know John's not the Messiah. He's clearly going to say no to that one, right? He's certainly not the political or military savior whom these religious leaders are hoping, are hoping for. Remember that when they say Messiah, what they mean is a political or military leader who's going to run out the Romans. And Jesus himself is skittish about claiming that title, right? Because that's not what he's there to do. He's there to save his people from their sins. So he never accepts the title Messiah except with some very careful preparatory work, some framing so that people know what he's talking about. So when these leaders ask John whether he is the Messiah, they're, they're asking whether he's the star of the show. Is he going to be this one to lead a revolution? John replies that he's not. He's just a supporting actor. But which one, they want to know. What role are you playing in this end time scenario of God? How are you going to support the new regime of the political and military Messiah? Here again, John must demur. It's not that he couldn't say yes to these questions. He could. But if he says yes without being careful, just like Jesus, he'll end up giving the wrong impression that he's there to support a political revolution, which is not what he's there to do. He knows that his purpose is to turn people away from their sins. That's what his version of the baptism ritual does. John didn't invent baptism. It was around before him. Uh, they didn't use it in the first century as a mode of initiation, which is often what we do with, as Christians. We initiate people into Christ's body through baptism. Uh, John didn't use it that way. Nor did he use it just for ritual cleanliness. Remember, the, the Jews of the first century were not allowed to come into the temple or worship God if they were ritually unclean. So they had a bath in pretty much every middle class to wealthy home had some sort of a bath. Archaeologists are digging these things up all the time. Um, it's one of the markers of a Jewish home in the first century, that there is a bathtub. There's a, a, a place to walk down into the cistern of water and be ritually cleansed. It wasn't a place to soap up and shampoo. Right? It was a place to be um, officially cleansed so that you could go and worship God in the temple. John's not using baptism that way either. John's baptism is a chance to confess your sins out loud in front of everybody and then publicly commit to repenting of them, to living the way that God has commanded, to choosing righteousness instead of selfishness. John is using baptism as a visible and powerful chance to prove one's identity before God, before the whole community of God's people, as a doer of righteousness. John wants baptism to function as a sort of real ID card for those who are ready to receive the message of the Messiah who will come after him, that Jesus will proclaim about himself. So to explain this and to prove his identity, John quotes the prophet Isaiah, who foretold the coming of one the voice crying out in the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord. John says, I baptize you with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. Baptism is not only the key to John's message, but it's the key to his own sense of identity. It's his ID card for all the world to see. It shows that he is not trying to be the star of the show, but that he's a supporting actor, someone who's pointing to the one who's coming after, who existed before him, who is greater than him. 
He says that even though he baptizes with water, this one who's coming after him will baptize with fire. As much more powerful as, as fire is than water, so much more will be the Messiah's baptism than John's. John's identity is based not on himself or what he wants out of life or where he's been or what he's done or his eye color or his height or weight. Right? That's not John's identity. John's identity is based on Jesus, the one who is coming, the one to whom he's pointing for all the world to see. His role is to prepare the straight paths, to prepare hearts that are ready for Jesus' coming by acknowledging their sins and turning away from them. John knows that the only reason he has a ministry, the only reason he was even born in the amazing way that he was, was to testify to God's beloved Son. And in this, we are very much like John the Baptist. We Christians here in O'Fallon, Illinois, in the 21st century. If someone were to ask you to prove your identity, who are you? They would ask you this today or tomorrow, what would you say? Who are you? How should you prove your identity beyond just the bare physical and social facts of your family or your background or where you've lived or what you've done? Like John the Baptist, our identity, our true identity, is not a matter of our physical description. Our true identity comes from Jesus Christ. It's centered on him. It's founded on him. It, it comes out of him. The number one fact of our existence, the very reason for our value, our descri the description of our role in society is this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We are the beloved and the redeemed of the Lord. Whatever good or bad that we've done, wherever we've lived, whatever our family has been, the cross and the resurrection overshadow these facts, and they give meaning and direction to them. Everything else about us is secondary. Everything else that people might say or might notice is secondary to this one basic fact. Christ died for us, for you. And he rose again for you. And his promise is for you to be resurrected at the last day. So our role in the world is just like John's, to point to him with our words and our deeds, to know Jesus and to make him known. So I have some homework for you. Would be a good idea this week, this coming week, this third week of Advent, to uh, make some ID cards for yourself. No, I'm not talking about going into the business of being a document forger. Here's what I mean. These guys. Uh, I, these are cards. They're, they've been laminated. Um, and they have printed on them Bible verses. And these are some of my favorite Bible verses. Uh, I made these uh, several years ago when I was, uh, I was thinking about these very questions. Who am I? I seem to be doing a job that, that it doesn't seem to be making much of, a, much of an impact. Well, who am I supposed to be in this world? What's my role? And as I was meditating on that, thinking about it, reading the scriptures, particularly the Psalms, uh, three sides of these are covered with Psalms, um, these were the verses that God brought to my mind and that I found in, in my reading, and they remind me of who I am. Still to this day, they do. Um, one here has some verses from Psalm 27. Uh, what if I had not believed that I should see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? O tarry and await the Lord's pleasure. One thing have I asked of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. It's a reminder that my identity comes from Christ that the one thing I should be seeking, the one thing I should ask of the Lord, is to be near him. Right. Um, some verses from Psalm 17. At my vindication, I shall see your face. When I awake, I shall be satisfied, beholding your likeness. It's a reminder of my destiny, that God has called me to the resurrection, and that one day I will wake up 
and behold his likeness, his face coming for me. Uh, one is a passage from the prophet Isaiah uh, that reminds me of my family, my parents, um, and even the circumstances of my own birth. So this points me back to how God has been active in my life from the very beginning. Um, and then another passage, a passage from Psalm 73. Um, <laughs> when I tried to understand these things, it was too hard for me until I entered the sanctuary of God and discerned the end of the wicked. Reminds me that this worship, this thing that we do every week, every day, coming into the presence of God is where we get understanding and how I, I put my own life in perspective. So I still come to these when I worry, when I, when I forget who I am. We don't use our, our government ID cards for when we forget who we are, but we do sometimes forget who we are in Christ. So your homework then, find at least one Bible verse, um, maybe a verse of a psalm, maybe um, John 3.16 like I just quoted, something that will remind you who you really are and who God has been in your life all your days. Put it on a card. Put it somewhere where you'll notice it and read it, at least for the rest of the season of Advent, so that you can be reminded of who you really are and how much God loves you. Amen. Please stand as we proclaim our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 326 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 326. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people, right one. 
Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church in the world. Almighty and everlasting God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Give grace, O heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy truth, true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to the congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in thy mercy. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Lord, in thy mercy. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that right rejoicing in thy holy creation, in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with the, their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. Lord, in thy mercy. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy, of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor Alex, Annette, Robert, Gordon, Grant, Jerry, Rosemary, Sherry, Debbie, the Kabisky family, Colt, Rhonda, Mikey, and Anna, Anna Claire. Are there others? and all those who in their transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in thy mercy, we pray thy blessing, O Lord, on all those who birthdays, whose birthdays we celebrate this week, especially Dana, Alex, and Stephanie, beseeching thee to fill them with thy grace and heavenly benediction, Lord, in thy mercy, we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in the, thy faith and fear, especially Lorraine, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace, so to follow the good examples of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Michael, and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. Ye who do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God, devoutly kneeling. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you. 
pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, from whose hand comes all that we need for life and godliness, we thank you for the generous gifts of your people, for the advance of your kingdom and the maintenance of your church. In them your people proclaim their trust in your providence. In them we make provision for the poor and needy among us. In them we see that same divine generosity by which you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to purchase our redemption. Through him we pray, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
A great thanksgiving is found on page 333 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 333. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, because thou didst send thy beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that, his precious death and sacrifice, until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty, with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness, vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that, by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, 
holy and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction and made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Our prayer after communion is found on page 339 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 339. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee for that Thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of Thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of Thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Please be seated for the announcements. Christmas is coming, of course. Christmas Eve services are coming. We will have a Christmas Eve service right here at St. Michael's. Uh, please do, if you would like to attend that service, make sure to let our office know. Send an email to Aaron, give her a phone call, let her know that you're planning on coming so that we can make sure we have enough seats marked off for everyone who wants to be here. Um, that will help us keep the social distancing that we need to keep so we can keep everyone safe. So again, please do call ahead if you're planning on coming uh, to uh, Christmas Eve services or send an email. And we will also have a Christmas Day service at 9.30 in the morning, but it will be a virtual service over Zoom. So if you're interested in that, also let us know. We'll make sure to send you the link to the Zoom uh, meeting, and we will do a Christmas Day morning prayer. I'll be coming to you from my basement in Missouri, and you'll be wherever you are, and we'll do a morning prayer service together. Jack Molman has provided music already, which we'll play, and so we can even sing. Uh, it'll be a wonderful time. So Christmas Day, 9.30 a.m. Zoom meeting. Let us know if you need that link. Are there any other announcements? Then receive the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.